Lakeland Public Television presents Currents. Hello, and welcome to Lakeland Currents. I'm Bethany Wesley. Tonight, we focus our spotlight on housing. More specifically, we will be discussing a growing need in outstate Minnesota for the development of more workforce housing. While you may occasionally hear about the need for some job growth throughout greater Minnesota, in some cities the jobs are there, or could be there. But the companies that are wanting to expand or establish themselves there are reluctant to do so because there is not enough middle income housing for would-be employees. So what exactly is workforce housing and why is there a shortage of it? To answer these questions and to discuss potential solutions, tonight we welcome to the program Dan Dorman, the Executive Director of the Greater Minnesota Partnership, and Tim Flathers, the Executive Director of the Headwaters Regional Development Commission. Welcome. Welcome back. Thanks, Bethany. Thank you. Thank you for having us. As we get started, why don't you tell us a little bit about what the Greater Minnesota Partnership is? Sure. Greater Minnesota Partnership is an advocacy organization that works on economic development issues in Greater Minnesota for Greater Minnesota. So our goal and our mission is to try to create uh, better jobs, improve job quality, improve the quality of life, helping to build tax base, vital cities, uh, vibrant cities, but exclusively in greater Minnesota. One thing that, you know, we noticed that uh, the metropolitan area, just because of that's where everybody's at, you're all herded up together, easier to organize, they have a stronger voice at the Capitol, so our job is to try to make sure greater Minnesota doesn't get lost in the in the hubbub, in the, in the mix, and so uh, we advocate, again, for greater Minnesota economic development programs. Tim, our viewers hopefully will recognize you from an earlier appearance, but tell us a little bit about what the HRDC's role is with housing specifically. Well, housing is an issue that is pretty broad uh, within our organization, and we're really interested in uh, meeting housing needs of communities throughout the region. It includes development of housing. We've focused on affordable housing principally. We have a nonprofit subsidiary corporation that does housing development work. Uh, we also provide staff support to a couple, um, or three right now, housing and redevelopment authorities. And um, um, we do things such as housing rehabilitation work, uh, down payment assistance, um, and uh, um, trying to make sure that people have access to affordable mortgage financing products, um, particularly in the home ownership side. So we do a, a variety of different things in the area of housing. And will you remind our viewers, if you'd be so kind, in terms of what your footprint is, in terms of what the HRDC manages? Yeah, the HRDC uh, Regional Development Commission serves five counties. We're headquartered here in Bemidji. Um, we go down to Park Rapids and serve Hubbard County. And then west we go to Clearwater County and Monoman County. And then north, Lake of the Woods County. So we serve Bidet, for example. Okay. All right, so as we turn our attention to workforce housing, Dan, what, can you tell us, how do you define workforce housing? How does it differ from, let's say, low-income housing? Yeah, I think, Bethany, the easiest way to think about it is, is, is middle earners. And if you think about, like, specific jobs, it's, it's, you know, it isn't about low-income, like food manufacturing workers or something because there's already programs for that. But it, it could be anyone from a beginning nurse, beginning teacher, or of course the, the manufacturing jobs, kind of that pay range of maybe 15 to $25 an hour right there. It's You make too much to qualify for low income stuff, but for some reason that I really can't explain, the market isn't responding like it should in creating, in, in this case what we're advocating for is more rental housing to, that will lead to single family uh, home ownership, but it, it's about uh, making sure that, that uh, there's a housing supply available for those people when those jobs are created. And, and it's, a, it's an issue, it's a growing issue, as we, you mentioned earlier, in almost all parts of greater Minnesota, from the southwest corner to northeast, northwest, uh, central Minnesota. It is a, uh, like I said, it's a, it's a growing deal. It's starting to hurt our uh, economic development and, and job creation in these cities. And so it, we think it's important that the legislature uh, take some action. Uh, we have a, a tax credit proposal we think would work, sort of copied it from uh, our neighbors in North Dakota and Iowa. We cobbled something together, you know, better to, you know, not reinvent something, than, you know, steal an idea that seems to work. And uh, we think it would really help these communities uh, continue to grow and prosper. When did the issue really kind of start to emerge? When did you start to hear things from communities that said, you know, we really could use some more of this market rate or middle income housing? Um, from my perspective, we first started hearing about workforce housing back in the mid-90s, and it, it became an issue. But I think the characteristic over the past few years, in, in my estimation anyway, um, we started to hear more and more about workforce housing for 
um, moderate income people or higher income people. I don't think that's a traditional part of the issue. Um, the market's being broken, I think, is a new twist on an, a very old problem that we've had. Okay. Yeah, I, I live in Albert Lee, and, and it's, it's funny you say the mid-90s, because that's when it started to become an issue there. Started to talk about it, uh, you know, form committees, and how are we going to do this? And our local communities really don't have the tools they need to respond to it. Uh, but I would agree with what Tim said. So there it was more maybe rehabilitation, low income. Uh, that seems to have uh, worked its way through in many communities, but it's that, you know, you, you, you don't make enough that, you know, you don't make $50 an hour, but you've got that, that again, that new teacher or uh, new technician. Um, they're having a hard time finding quality, uh, a quality place to live. And what, is that, what does that do? Well, it becomes a, a competitive issue. Well, why do I want to live in this community? I, I want a decent place to live and raise my family. And so uh, we think that it's, it's an important uh, issue to be solved. But I would say it started in some ways in the mid-90s, but really over the last probably 10 years, that middle income has really uh, grown in importance. And the legislature so far hasn't reacted. You know, there's always that lag, right? It makes some sense. But uh, it, it's really on the forefront. The state is very active in housing. We've been roughly uh, you know, almost $100 million a year in, in primarily low-income stuff. So the state does have an active role and plays an active role in housing in a lot of ways. We think this is just an area that needs some attention. Tell me a little bit about how widespread the issue is. We talk a lot about rural or outstate or greater Minnesota. Is it throughout all those areas? Is, are there pockets of it that are experiencing it more than others? You know, I think there definitely is. I think when you look at, uh, when was, you know, in the news lately, Thief River Falls and a possible expansion by DigiKey, they've got a problem. Roseau, uh, down in my neck of the woods, both Elberly and Austin, you know, the interesting thing, uh, the city manager from Austin was in St. Paul this week to testify on behalf of our bill. They haven't built a market rate ap apartment building in Austin, right, Homer Hormel, haven't built a market rate ap uh, apartment building in 45 years. And it, it is getting to be a problem for them. So we hear it, you know, there. It's maybe not quite the same issue, even though they have different housing issues in communities like St. Cloud, Rochester, Mankato. Uh, they probably have some different issues, but it's still an issue for them as well. Uh, there are some pockets in the metropolitan area that would say they, they have needs, but it's really different because in the metropolitan area, they have seen uh, growth in this area and people are building apartments and you know the one thing that that I think makes the case for state investment is if you think about other state investments in the metropolitan area it's really helped their their housing market you look at the light rail the green line light rail or the post the proposed southwest uh, light rail corridor when that was being talked about I remember there was an article in the uh, Star Tribune and there was a big fight going on over you know, what kind of housing was, might create too much high income, not enough of low income and all this. And I'm thinking, you know, what a good problem to have, right? We don't have those mega investments by the state that, that help create housing in greater Minnesota. And that's why we think that some of the proposals that we're advocating make sense and would bring some equity to the distribution of, of state resources. So as I was preparing for this, you know, you diff look at different articles and different research out there, and they said that there are businesses that want to expand or, you know, either relocate or expand but they are hampered because there's not enough housing. You're hearing that repeatedly then. Right, and they're writing checks. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at, at Agco and Jackson, you look at DigiKey, you look at Polaris, you've got these, these corporations are also writing checks to try to help stimulate this. That's not occurring in the metropolitan area. There's another program that doesn't quite work like we'd like it to, with maybe some help it could, but it's called a, a challenge grant program, right? And I, I was interested this week by the uh, data sheet that was put out by the state, and, and it had all the, all the projects on one side and what they did, and then the last column was local investment. And all all of the uh, corporations that had contributed to help do this uh, were in Greater Minnesota. All the metropolitan projects, because it's so much easier to do there, hadn't required that contribution. You know, sometimes I think that if, if those guys had to write checks to uh, see this happen, it would probably get solved a lot sooner. But, uh, you know, we'll, we'll deal with what we have to deal with and advance our, our cause and tell our story. And, and I think it's compelling and hopefully will result in, in uh, greater economic development opportunities in Greater Minnesota. Tim, in your conversations with the clients in the areas that you represent, I mean, have you heard similar concerns in terms of, you know, needing more of that middle middle income housing out there? Absolutely. I, well, first of all, I'd say um, when I have discussions in communities about housing, it's usually broader than just the workforce housing sure. issue that we're describing. It's usually we have a lot of housing needs, including the workforce mm -hmm. housing need as we're discussing it. Um, one example I'd use is Black Duck because we've been having um, a lot of current conversation with them, but Anderson Fabrics, major employer, key critical um, employer for Black Duck, 
um, not only wants to expand, they have been expanding, but unfortunately their expansion is taking place in Chicago. They're contracting for employment because they don't have the housing to support an expanding workforce. Um, and like Dan suggested, they're, they're a willing partner in trying to make something happen, but they're dealing in a pretty tough housing market at the same time. So we need to find ways, including what we're talking about here, to try to help Black Duck meet those needs. As you talk about this issue, I'm assuming you've talked with developers in terms of, you know, what would it take to get, to get more development happening? How do they... How do they respond? What is the problem? You know, the, our, our chief author in the Senate is from uh, Red Wing, Senator Goggin. And when I first met him, because he's new, met him this year, before I could even start going through the proposal, he said, I know exactly what you're talking about, because I've got a couple of developers in our area that tell me they can build high-end stuff and they can build uh, low-end stuff or, or affordable stuff because there's a lot of subsidies. What they can't figure out how to do is this middle income stuff because whether it's financing, there's a whole lot of reasons that seem to have broken the market. Uh, and, and I wish it was different. It just isn't. And, and that, so, yeah, that, that's what it is. It's, it's that kind of that gap of, of uh, what are the rents in the community? How does this translate into a performer to build a, a new apartment building? And it just isn't working out very well in greater Minnesota. You have some issues with, you know, if you, you build it, you go get the appraisal, you try to borrow money against it, the appraisals don't match what you're putting in like they would in the metropolitan area. So you have a problem with financing. So there's a whole lot of problems. That's why we think that we've got a sort of a market-based solution, a, a tax credit program that would help address that and we really believe that this doesn't have to be you know I think we're going to be in the affordable or, or low income business forever right we're always going to have to take care of people and we should uh, we hope that after four or five years of a program like this that the market starts to correct and say hey you know we can make money we can uh, cash flow these projects in greater Minnesota so we're hoping this jump starts the, the market and doesn't need to become a permanent program do you hear concerns too about, I mean, you talked about Black Duck, um, in terms of these smaller or more rural cities that might just have one or two key em employers, are they hesitant because there's always the chance they could pick up and relocate? There's no question about it because you're, you know, if you think about it, if we say we all decide we're, we're done with this, we're going to go form a, a housing corporation, we're going to go build apartments and lease them out, right? If we go to the Twin City metropolitan area or Rochester or, or St. Cloud, we're not dependent on one or two manufacturers. But when you're dependent on that one manufacturer, boy, you hope they're, you know, you've got your eggs are in that same basket as theirs. And there's, uh, that, is a, that is another one of the concerns that developers have that I think is impeding some of the uh, development. And it's not only the developers, the developers have to get financing, so you have to think about it from that standpoint too. Um, so there's risk on both parts. And the risk is heightened if you um, run into that situation. In some ways it's got to almost sound almost like a good problem for communities to have. You have businesses that want to invest, mm -hmm. that want to grow in your, your community, right. but they're being hampered that's what you're hearing, that communities no are question. losing out on yeah. potential yeah. opportunities. And they just don't have the tools available to them that even in the low income area, uh, say, you know, whatever city, Black Duck, Bemidji, they could do a low income uh, TIF or tax increment financing package for I think up to 25 years to do, do a low income project. Uh, they can't do that for workforce. And so there's a bill that we support to help change that to, to allow uh, communities maybe more uh, local tools, but that still isn't going to be enough to, I think, spur the kind of development that is really required. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about what it is that you would like to see happen. Tell us a little bit about what the proposal is that you've really been trying to work sure. with legislators on. Sure. Uh, it's a tax credit proposal. It is a 40% uh, tax credit up to a million dollars per investor. Uh, up to $2.8 million a project. So we want to make sure there's more than just one project done. We don't want to see it get gobbled up, uh, you know, one project a year. But really the ask isn't that large. It's $6.6 .6 million this year. That, you know, that's not going to fix the problem in one year, uh, but it would be a good start. And, uh, and so what would happen is the developer would apply for the credit, they'd get the credit, build the project, and then be able to take advantage of that of that uh, tax credit. So we think it's a, uh, a good way to, also a good way to target this because sometimes there's been uh, overproduction of low income units uh, that so you have a higher vacancy rate there than, than you might want to have where you know if you if you create that investment in, or the uh, incentive for a developer they're still going to put this in an area where it's needed otherwise you know even with that tax credit that's not going to uh, work out if there's not enough people there that will lease these new units. So we think it uh, our, our proposal will target this a little better as well. Are you finding support? 
It, it varies. Uh, last year we did make it into the Senate tax bill, not the final tax bill. It didn't get passed anyway. But uh, after two years, we finally got into there. Uh, you know, it varies. I think that uh, you know we've got some work to do with the number of new legislators because I think they hear what we're talking about and hear low income and then see all those dollars that are going there and figure, well, this is already being taken care of. So it is an education process to get the, the new people up to speed on it. But uh, yeah, I, I, I'm optimistic that we're going to see something happen this year. Uh, there was a grant program that was started a couple years ago. Uh, we supported it. We had, you know, we thought there was going to be some issues with it surve uh, around, surrounding the uh, concept of prevailing wage requirements that came with it. So if you look at the project in Roseau, I think the uh, first year it was like a $700,000 grant. They had to come back the next year and, and put in almost, I think, the same amount to make the project happen. So there are some there are some issues, I think, in that program that could be worked out to make it work better. Um, but we think our, our tax credit proposal would actually result in uh, more units being built in, in a quicker fashion. Is it fair to say that when you're talking about this, you have to be really careful to make sure that you want additional funds versus like perhaps taking some away from low income housing, you know what I'm saying, to make sure you can get both? I'm pretty passionate about that because, frankly, I, I think from a state perspective, um, we this is a tool that's really, really needed, but um, we still have a really big need for affordable housing. Um, I don't characterize it just as low income, but it's low and moderate income. Um, but income-assisted housing of some level is still needed in, in, at least in the region that I serve, it's pretty universal. And so, yeah, I do think it's... Uh, we do want to be careful with that because this is all about um, um, an additional investment in housing in an area that has not been addressed in the past. Okay. Right. But it shouldn't replace other things. I mean, you know, if you think about it, uh, probably the, the highest priority would be homeless people, right? I mean, it would be hard for me to say, oh, no, don't do right. that and do this, right? And, and so yeah. it is, it is, it, it's an additive. It's a need that we have, but I, I do think it's justified again because of you look at how the state influences the housing market, the metropolitan area. We talked about the light rail, Viking Stadium. These things do create housing, and we just don't have, because we're sort of located all over, right? We don't have that light rail, but we do have a, a, a good interstate system. We're trying to, uh, you know, improve that uh, all the time as well. And I should point out, we, well, we've got those good roads and stuff. It's important to use those, drive safely on those roads, put that cell phone down when you're when you're driving, and obey the speed limits. So I think that's important too. I'm Absolutely. Plugging that for a totally different reason, but. <laughs> so tell me, I know that some companies have really gotten kind of creative in terms of how they're going to stay. They don't want to leave these communities. I think, is there one that's like busing people an hour or so to try to, to, keep, to keep their employees keep. going? And so, yeah. you know, have you heard from companies that they really do want to be in rural Minnesota? Um, I was just at a board meeting last night and one of my commissioners lives in Shevlin and he was talking about people in his community that are busing um, up to Thief River Falls and working at DigiKey. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's pretty successful and people are willing to do that because it's a, it's a good job opportunity and there's no housing available close by. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, they want to be in their community anyway, but they don't really have an opportunity to move because there's no housing anyway. There's just no opportunities for them. Yeah. There's, there's companies in the southwestern part of the state too that are running their own transit systems to, to bring people to work. Mayo Clinic, in fact, does one. They run their own buses around that area to, to make sure they can get people to work. But yeah, that, that's how I don't say desperate, but I mean they don't want to do that, right? They'd rather be spending their time and resources improving their business and selling more product and employing more people. But part of that for some of these companies has been uh, transit systems. And again, that's different than the metropolitan area. And so, um, again, we're not trying to take anything away from them. We're just trying to say, hey, we've, we've got different needs and, and they need to be addressed. Each community has its own unique needs, I'm sure, as you guys hear yeah. repeatedly. Yeah, I think, I think Tim was right that you know, it depends on where you go. It's a different, it's a different mix. Some some areas need a lot of both. Some areas need more of, of, of affordable than others. Some people say, hey, we've got plenty of affordable, but this middle income. So I don't think it's a cookie cutter. Right. You know, I, I think every town is almost different. Uh, there's not a there's not a one size fits all solution. Do you find that there's communities that exist that have some housing available, it's just not what they need? So like the low income housing, for example, they could live there, but they don't meet those income requirements? Yeah, I, I can't speak specifically for this area. Uh, I live in Albert Lee, and you know, one way we hear a lot from the school district that this is a problem. And uh, I know a guy that manages a Section 8 building. It's a nice building down by the lake, 
and he can always tell when the new teachers are in town because there's the knock on the door, hey, you have signed me up, right? Oh, well, great, what do you do? He said, well, just you know, took a job at the school district. I'm like, eh, sorry, you make too much money. So those units sit empty, you know, it's not a, not a high rate, but there's always empty units there. They sit empty where, you know, you've got these other people are saying, well, maybe I don't want to move to this town. Maybe I, maybe I want to go to the cities because I can live in a, you know, in a better apartment. Uh, and that is happening. It's, it's a strange deal, uh, but it is happening. And I think, you know, you're going to see more more school districts start to talk about this, which is really uh, different than what you think. I mean, the, the mindset is underpaid, somehow factory workers, you know, this nefarious evil. It really isn't that. It's, it's really people that are making a decent wage, but they also want a decent place to live. And who wouldn't? What's wrong with that? Let's talk about some of the tools that do exist. You referenced TIF earlier in terms of the way that it can be used to develop certain types of housing. Is TIF not an option for a housing development such as this? Not for not for market rate housing. Okay. It is for low income, but the legislature restricts the you know which always bothers me. You know it seems like uh, in full disclosure, I'm a former state legislator. And when we run for election, right, we're all in favor of local control. And it seems like too many of us when we get to St. Paul now want to control the locals. So they, they do not let cities, uh, we've joined with the League of Cities trying to change that, the, the coalition's a partner in it, trying to make sure that we could use TIF, but in the cities that I've talked to, they're going to use it, no question about it, but it isn't going to be enough in and of itself. So I think that would be a, a needed tool, and it's local dollars. There are no state dollars in uh, TIF programs. So you know why St. Paul restricts it that way is beyond me. Uh, I think our communities are responsible. Uh, if if the city council says, hey, this is what we want to do, and this is this makes sense for our community, I have no idea why the state's standing in the way, but that's a tough sell in St. Paul. And, and why is it a tough sell? It's because I think some of the abuses that people have seen, and they've occurred in the metropolitan area. Well, don't, don't ring us up for that, you know. In fact, one uh, a senator who will go un unnamed, but this particular senator was originally against TIF for anybody, but, th but then th kind of moderated their position and said, you know, I guess this does make sense in the metro area because you kind of sit down with them and have that conversation about uh, it's a little different game out here. Th th again, it's not the same as better, worse, or anything. It's just different. And, and so you might need different tools in the, metro in the metropolitan area. They've got different tools. We may need some different tools. There's nothing wrong with that. Is that a big part of your process right now, trying to educate in terms of the, the problem for rural or for metro-based legislators? Yeah, absolutely, and even the, even the new Greater Minnesota legislators, because for some of them, you know, you, you're learning so many things. There's LGA, other issues that are flying at you, transportation, what do all these things mean? And you've got to try to uh, figure this out. And somebody's over here talking about housing, but, uh, you know, we're spending all this money over here. So, yeah, there's, a, there's an education piece to it. It's, it's, uh, that's why we're there. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, um, that's one of the reasons, like, and, um, that we're really interested in being part of the partnership is that we don't have the ability to be spending time in St. Paul. Um, you know, we're, we're four hours away, um, and so it's just difficult, and being a member of the partnership allows us to be part of a voice that's going to be heard, because we don't necessarily think individually we're going to be heard very loudly, at least. Right. And so it's, it's been a good thing for us to be a member um, of a group of uh, communities throughout the state that are engaged in these dialogues and willing to provide some leadership to try Absolutely. to get things done. Yeah. The Center for Rural Policy, uh, they were in St. Peter, they came out with a report about four years ago, who speaks for Greater Minnesota, the capital, on these issues. And at the end of the day, the report said nobody. Uh, they also didn't think anybody could do it, that it would be too hard to do what we're doing, but we don't believe that. We think we can get it done. But one thing they noted in that was that, you know, the Metropolitan Area has their own organizations, but also the statewide organizations, and not, again, intentionally, but are picking up a metropolitan feel. And, and Tim hit on one of the reasons, right? Uh, there's one organization that has a, a meeting right before session to put their priorities together. It's an afternoon uh, like a Friday afternoon typically in St. Paul, you don't get people driving four or five hours to come down for a three-hour meeting, right? So who's in the room tends to be, and I've been there, uh, it tends to be people, like if you do the dot and then draw the, the area, unless there's a board member, it's people that are within 75 miles of the metropolitan area, right? And so that's a statewide organization, but that's who's there at the meeting, and then that's what their, uh, their priorities begin to pick up that metropolitan feel, even though it's unintentional. And that's what that Center for Rural Policy report uh, talked about was that you know somebody needs to be out there talking about hey don't forget us you know again it isn't it isn't we're trying to take anything away from it. we're just trying to say hey because uh, I don't think people in the metropolitan area wake up in the morning and say boy let's put the screws to those guys up in Bemidji or that dormant in El 
or <coughs> hey, let's go, you know, make things hard for them. It's just not top of mind because they've got their own stuff they're dealing with, and it's just it's important. It's important that Greater Minnesota have that voice at the Capitol on a consistent basis. Do you have any time, any idea in terms of what kind of number of units could be beneficial statewide? I mean, has there been any research into actual figures in terms of the stats, in terms of how much could be used? I think, uh, Minnesota Housing Finance would say, I should have brought the brochure, but as I recall, uh, it's about 6,000 units. It, you could, right now, I mean, today. That they could fill them today if they were constructed. If they were constructed. So, I mean, there is a, a big, that's why in, in one of the committees this week, uh, People were like, "Well, why don't you do this as well? Why don't you do this as well?" Trying to to help the bill, right? Well, just you know, do some low in, or do some uh, single family home stuff. And another representative pointed out, it's only six million dollars a year. It's not, you know, you, this isn't going to solve all housing issues. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if you think of the scale, we're talking about six million a year versus a hundred million a year in, in low income. Again, that's not bad. I'm not saying take that money. I'm just saying you think of the scale. Uh, we can't solve the the that at a hundred million dollars a year. We're going to have a hard time. You know, making a big dent in it at, at, at even six million dollars a year. The the deed program I referenced earlier is only two million dollars a year, and while nice, it, it just isn't enough to really bend that curve very much. Is the lag time concerning then, in a way, you know, that the need is here now, and even if you got funds yet this year, it's going to take what two years to get them constructed and operational. Yeah. The, the nice thing, and one reason, you know, that we've, we're trying to uh, establish this program with Indeed or the Department of Employment and Economic Development. The other, the big housing players, Minnesota Housing Finance Agency, and because of the nature of their programs, they've got federal tax credits, it's a much more complicated process. But we were at a meeting in Thief River Falls with the League of Minnesota Cities and Minnesota Chamber trying to understand the issue, get more information. And one of the cities talked about when they did a MFHA project, it was a two-year project, Process, the deed grant program, they were able to get it spun around less than a year. So that's one reason why we want to work with deed because we think that this is, we look at this economic development, not, you know, low-income housing. And so deed is, seems to be much more responsive. That's not a criticism. I mean, I should have to throw that in there so I don't get a bunch of angry people. It's just different and it's a different need. And, and uh, so hopefully it's not two years. Are you feeling kind of confident at all? I mean, do you feel like there might be a chance of success yet this year? I, I do. I, I do. I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I hope it's the whole six million. That I don't feel as confident about, but I, I think we're going to see some action. You know, we've seen growth each year that we've tried this. First year, we couldn't get any traction. Next thing you know, we're in the Senate tax bill. So hopefully this is the year that we're able to push it over that end line and actually get it signed into law. Well, I want to thank you both for joining me today. Um, thank you for tuning in. If you'd like to learn more about the Greater Minnesota Partnership or this issue, I encourage you to visit the website on the bottom of the screen. Thank you. Join me next time.